stand up because it will be quite boring and I don't want to fall asleep during the presentation. <laughs> um, this, is, this is about a li little bit about game programming in Clojure, but don't expect too much game programming or too much Clojure. This is just about the, the central part of a, a game's architecture, which is uh, generally called the main loop. Or uh, in similar interactive act applications, you can also call it uh, event loop. Uh, if, we, if we look at a, a typical game, what happens is, is something like a ripple, something like a loop, where we see something or we, we perceive something, we hear something, and then we react to it. And then based on our reactions, computer does some more calculations and then shows us something or, or plays a different sound, and then we react again, and so on and so forth. We keep looping through uh, these events. If we take the simplest possible loop, but not maybe uh, the most useful loop, but actually in practice quite uh, commonly used loop, uh, it looks like something a little bit like this, where update is basically changing our uh, current state to a new state, and then render is, is presenting uh, the, the new state to the uh, player. And this dt is the uh, time delta. So every time this main loop, this function that is called main loop is called, every time uh, we, need, we need to know how much time has passed between the last call and uh, uh, this current call. But this one, since we are closure programmers and functional programmers, uh, this one, uh, of course, implies state. So my, my world is somewhere else, and I am uh, mutating it uh, through some other means. If we improve on this and pass the world to our main loop now, we first call the update function with the old world to compute the new world. We render based on the new world. And then we, we return the new world so that we, we leave keeping track of the new world to uh, whoever is calling this main, main loop. This one is better, but uh, user inputs are missing. So, so user inputs are kind of like a side effect in terms of uh, input. If we improve it a little more, this time our main loop function can take the world, the old world, the events since the last invocation, and the delta time, then compute, given the world uh, events and dt to update function, the new world. At this point in time, we can forget about the events until the loop is called next. We have already consumed them. We're done with them. Then we render our world, and then return the new world. And this, this is a simple, simple structure of the uh, our main loop. So games are supposed to be fun, and they are, they are supposed to be responsive to our actions. So the, uh, maybe not the gold standard, but, but the usually what is expected is that a game run, runs at a 60 frames per second or more or less, depending on the game. If you're, if you're building a roguelike, you may be OK with one, one frame per second or less. But usually, uh, you, you are uh, aiming to go 60 frames per second, which means if a second is 1,000 milliseconds, which means you need to be done with all this uh, generating the events. Basically, the, the, the entire call of main loop should com complete within 16 milliseconds, which is not a lot of time especially if your code is not uh, optimized. So, so before I move on, I just want to illustrate what I mean by this. Let's, let's take a 16 millisecond chunk. We haven't done anything yet. We first, we call our main loop. We, do, we call our update, and let's suppose our update takes five milliseconds. So almost half of our allocation, time allocation is already gone. And then we call the render. Let's say it takes three milliseconds. So within eight milliseconds, we are done. This, this is a happy scenario. But in another, in another frame, maybe our update took uh, less time, but render still hasn't finished when we have uh, used up our allocation of 16 milliseconds. And then it goes to the next frame. 
it's still rendering and then at, at some point in, in the next frame it is done with the rendering. So what, what happens in this, in this kind of uh, design is we skipped one frame. And if we keep skipping frames, the, the animations, the, the, the visual effect of the game will not be smooth. And also we skipped updating our uh, world, but that is less of a problem. Uh, how to approach this? I'm just going to ask the questions, not, not provide answers at this point. Uh, we can try uh, scheduling an update right after render. In the first 16 millisecond slot, it ended up early, right? I can, without waiting for the uh, uh, empty slot, without waiting for the next 16 seconds, I can just call my update. In this case, I will be calling, most probably calling update uh, more frequently. Uh, but it also has a downtime where you are also calling your render at uh, unstable rates, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. So you're not, you're not fixing on your uh, frame rate. The second consideration is we can try running our render and update in separate threads so that they don't compete for the limited time. But then uh, they will be competing on uh, the world because they both depend on world. So while update is updating, changing the world, uh, render will try rendering uh, the world at the same time. So uh, we are a little bit closer uh, to get this right. If we use a persistent data structure, we can give render the previous version while we are generating the uh, newer version. But if you are uh, building a game and uh, you want to have a high frame rate, maybe the persistent data structures are not for you, maybe. So how do we do things? Simple case is how do we know what time is it now? Uh, this is very basic. Uh, system is, is some Java lang system. I think uh, it will get imported uh, in the closure environment. You can just call it like this. And it is, it is going to give you the time as some sort of integer. I don't remember if it's int or not, but it, it, it's an it's a integer number. It's a long. Yes, OK. Uh, but if usually you, want, you don't want a millisecond precision uh, time. You want a time with more precision. So instead, you can call a nano time, and then it will give you a double, uh, and then divide it by a million to get the milliseconds. But this, this milliseconds, we also have the fractions. Uh, the previous code, we were just looking at what time is it now. What this structure does is it gives you a function. And each time you call the function, it will give you a, a number that is the milliseconds passed since the last invocation of the function. Uh, Anything interesting here? I'm looking, nothing interesting. On the contrary, I, I am not able to find, since I'm using an atom, I need to use swap, right? I am not able to find a way to write this with swap. So I'm just using atom as a uh, synchronized uh, dump, uh, like an atomic integer kind of thing. And the usage is, I first call this function, I get another function, then I keep calling that function, and every time I call, it gives me the time passed since the last invocation or the generation. So here it is, after invoking this, it is uh, 0 0.12 something something milliseconds, and I, I sleep for 1,000 milliseconds, then it gives me a, a delta time like 1,000 uh, plus plus uh, milliseconds. And yes, here we can also use integers, long, uh, something like that. But uh, it, de it, depends on, it depends on whether you want to measure time precise, how precisely. How do we exit the game? Again, I, I propose a simple way to do that. We can just use a promise and then check whether this promise is somewhat delivered or not. Uh, and then when I want to exit, I will just uh, deliver the promise anything. Can be nil, can be something else. And then the next time my main loop will be called. Uh, 
it will check for this and then exit if necessary. Uh, by the way, both the DTFN and uh, this exit mechanism is, is thread safe. So uh, there are also ways to do it without being thread safe. In the first section, we looked at the main loop, which, when you're, which is about your game. This, this is about calling that main loop and using all these other pieces that we just looked at uh, to make it uh, a sensible main loop. Coming back to the other 60 FPS discussion, uh, there are two concepts that are kind of uh, uh, racing uh, against each other. One is the update rate and one is the frame rate. And they have different effects. Frame rate should be stable, but if it can be degraded as well, or it can be higher, uh, it will impact the experience uh, of the uh, player. Updates also should be stable, but not necessarily they're synchronized together. Most important thing is, since we are not locking on a particular frame rate or update rate, because it's not guaranteed in any way, uh, especially in the update case, updates shouldn't depend on what time is it now. Updates should depend on rather how much time has passed. Or they shouldn't depend on how many times I have been called. For example, if I'm, if I'm making something walk, uh, it shouldn't walk according to just its speed. And assuming that, OK, how many times I will uh, update, OK, divide it by this much, and then every time step this much. Instead, it should look at the delta time and the speed, and then calculate how much it should advance. In, and actually, uh, suppose if it's a very fast moving uh, object, between the two calls to update, it may go through its target. Let's say I'm, I'm firing a bullet. It's supposed to hit something. I, I call update here. I call update here. I miss my target. So in, in those cases, what we want to do is we want to subsample. If, I, if it moves from here to here, I want to subsample the path a few times, maybe three, four times, to see whether it had hit the target in between my two calls of update. Last thing is, uh, last thing is uh, what I said earlier. It is likely that you will want mutability in your world to, to update it faster. And then the problem comes uh, if you run your render thread in a separate thread. Uh, one, one potential solution, which is not ideal solution, is, is to do double frame. You can have two worlds. And if you have a, a fast way to copy one into another, you can have two worlds. You can update this one, and then render this one, and then start updating this one with the previous frame and the next frame, or copy this one to this. And then uh, you can swap what are you doing with which one. Update render, update render, and so on. But you need to have a, a fast copy. OK, code example. This is a, this is a tight loop. And it, it will never uh, uh, terminate. I generate my delta time. I create my world. I, I get my event somehow magically. And then I, I get my uh, delta time. And then I call my main loop. It gives me back the new world. And then I, I loop. And this, this doesn't give the other threads to uh, uh, space to breathe. We can make a small change to this to allow the other, other threads, if there are any other threads, uh, to, to get a chance to use the same core that this, this main thread is using by just calling uh, yield on thread. Uh, by the way, this, this yielding is at only at the JVM level, not on the OS level. On the OS level, uh, uh, if we are running other programs, other processes, uh, they are fine. But on the JVM, if I don't yield, and if I'm using all the cores, uh, then, then some of the other threads will never get a chance to work. Uh, and the final step is to make it terminate. Just the same code that I showed earlier. I have my escape patch. Again, I call my main loop, pass my escape patch. I'm not changing my main loop. 
the only thing I expect from the main loop is that at some point uh, when, when it's time to finish, to deliver, my, deliver this promise. And then I check if it is uh, delivered. Uh, if it is delivered, this, uh, this closure with, will end. If it is not, it will recur. Quick question. Yes. Why do you have an escape patch that's set for Instead of like like like, like, a, like a exception. Could could well no, couldn't it be in the world state, like mm. you know, game over or state of the world? Yes, yes. It can be. Very 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 fair. Uh, so for example, th this is a very, very simple example. For example, I would rather not mix my say screen resolution, screen uh, width and height, for example, or my audio level, volume. These, these secondary things I wouldn't put in my world. I wouldn't like to do that. I would only like to do, put abstract things about my game in my world, ideally. But very fair question. Um, so, so probably, yes, probably, there is a, there, probably you will use a single state data structure and have these secondary things as well. But then you will, in a real world example, you will have a world and in that world, you want just your entities in, in your game. Make sense? Makes sense, yeah. So like the, or the escape hatch could be triggered by something outside the world. Something out, yes, but something inside your main loop, right? Yeah. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. So, so most likely, uh, there will be an event like pressing the escape key or something like that, that triggers this escape. But yeah, there's nothing special about escape hatch. Uh, so, going through this nice closure call, let's take a look at some real-world examples. My first example is not exactly like closure, like it's, it's more like a 0% closure, but it's a very, very interesting library, very simple. Uh, it's called uh, Love2D. Uh, it has a very, very simple structure and it is written in Lua. And it has a very good community as well. Uh, it, and one, one thing very important for me is it is not a framework, it's a library. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, it become your master at any time. Its structure is quite simple. There is an initialization function, there is an update, and there is a drop. So you know what, what should go where. Uh, here's an example program. Does everything fit? Yeah. So in, during initialization, it says the uh, font size. And then I have some nice uh, evil global state here. And then my update function just takes the delta time and then increases this global state. And then it just prints something on the screen. Very simple. Uh, of course, when, you're, when you go into it and when you start writing an actual game, you need to create a lot more things. But the top level structure stays the same. And I just want to show how they implemented their main loop. This is not fitting on the screen. I will not show you the entire thing. The slides are on my GitHub. You can uh, check the entire thing later. Uh, but I, I want to show you the abbreviated version. So here it does a bunch of things to, to get and process the events first. Then calculates the DT, then calls update, then calls draw, then uh, uh, blitz the whatever is drawn off screen to the screen and then sleeps for one millisecond. This is in seconds. So in the beginning, when I, when I showed you the simple but useless uh, main loop, actually, this is exactly that, the, the simple, uh, nothing fancy kind of main loop. How do, they, how do they solve the problem of 16 milliseconds? They don't. Okay. They, they, they leave that for the uh, developers to solve, like whoever is using it. So, so yes. they. They just call your update, they just call your draw, and then they just uh, see for one millisecond. Yeah. They don't synchronize their frames. So they there's no guarantee whatsoever. Yes, and, and they don't synchronize their frames. Like, they don't say, I will not run faster than this much. Yeah. It is left to you, there's a function you can call to get the, you can use DT, you can use something to sleep more, so you uh, stabilize your frame rate, but they don't do anything about it. They just keep looping. The second example is 
has, has a little more closure in it. It's called uh, Play CLGS, which is something like a, a new, new form of Play CLG, which is based on, which used to be based on libgdx, which is a very nice uh, uh, game library on Java, very capable. This one is based on some JavaScript framework called P5, which has something to do with processing, I think, as the processing rules. I don't know much about it. Um, in play CLGS and also in play CLG, which is not maintained anymore, uh, they have two concepts, a screen and a game. Screen is like a, like a stage or scene of your game, like a part of your game's life cycle. You enter the scene, you do something, and then you enter another scene. There's always one scene. <clears throat> And essentially, it, it says show, hide, and uh, render, uh, initialization, destruction, and uh, update, right? The game, you don't, as far as I understand, you don't need to deal with the game protocol directly too much. But I just want to show you how it looks like. Uh, you, you call start on it, and then it starts. And then there, there are a bunch of functions that you need to call uh, in your screen some of these functions. And another nice thing, let me show you, uh, is that in their rendering code, they, they use a data structure. So they have this abstraction uh, that, that gives you data-driven uh, approach. This is, this is an example of a screen. It is, it is very similar to the uh, uh, love, love code that we have just looked at, the basic game. I want to now take a look at their main loop implementation. Here it is quite undecipherable, uh, but if you, if you go through this, this is again a, a long piece of code. If you look, look at it from the draw function, draw is repeatedly called, it calls redraw. Is the, just one second. Uh, yes, okay. So request animation frame uh, is basically the browser's mechanism to schedule something to happen just before they refresh the browser screen so that you can avoid flickering and other problems, similar problems. So this function keeps rescheduling itself and it, it keeps getting called. And, and the browser decides when to call this function. And this function checks other stuff and calls redraw. And redraw does a bunch of things about the framework and calls user redraw, which is the draw function that you give this framework. So this is the play, play JS. Uh, I, I, I had to look at, uh, this is the uh, P5 code. Yes, this is P5.js code. The, the link works, by the way, if, if you're interested later. So the third uh, example I want to show is also a closure example. And it, this is one example that I can say uh, that got me initially interested in closure or got me invested in closure, uh, which is the caves of closure code. And there is a, uh, I think, eight or 10, something like that, part series about game programming in Clojure. Uh, I, I uh, strongly suggest that this, this link goes there. And it's about using a terminal emulator and Clojure, the JVM-based uh, terminal emulator, Clojure, to build a, a roguelike. And for example, there are things like generating this, this very nice uh, map uh, the algorithm that generates this map that makes it look kind of like a cave structure is, is quite interesting. Uh, having said that, our topic is uh, main loop. So let's look at the main loop part. This is the uh, main loop for uh, the caves of closure. It is uh, quite different than what we have seen so far. It does something very interesting. It is again like, like a REPL. Like a, um, it's more like an apply evolve cycle. There are two phases. 
in this phase, there are some inputs to process, and it processes inputs and does nothing else. And then it, it recurs. When I process the inputs, I get back a world. And I recur with the world again. Or sorry, game. In the second phase, if I don't have any events, this time I update, then I draw, then this clear messages, I, I don't know what it does. And I get I call get input. So uh, and get input is blocking. So it, it stops that. It will not again uh, try to uh, read the events. Uh, this, is a, this is a property of some of the roguelites. Rogue -likes. Uh, they don't do anything in real time. They always wait for some user action, even if it is do nothing action. They wait for user action. So it's, it's kind of like chess in that sense. E every time you play, computer plays, you play, computer plays. Another interesting uh, thing I want to mention is this part. So it doesn't do anything with the UIs. But here it checks whether UIs, uh, whether in the sequence there's something in the sequence. So basically, uh, they, they are designing the, the game as a stack of UIs. Stack of, yes, yeah, stack of UIs. Like think of it like mod, model, um, model uh, windows. Uh, so when you close the last one, when you get rid of the last one in the stack, it will exit. It will, it will terminate and exit. So you start with one UI, you want to do something on top of maybe this is the menu. You want to you wanna start the game, you start the game, and then maybe you want to show something model, you show that, and inventory maybe, inventory is dismissed, you are back to the game, the game ends, you're back to the menu, uh, you, you exit from the menu, menu is gone, this is nil, and uh, we terminate. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a rogue like. Oh, okay. Is there a copy of that? Or? No, it's independent implementation. Yeah.